Many people in the modern world have become distant from their food. They may not know where it's grown, who grows it, who produces it, or who harvests it, what impact its production has on the environment, how it is processed, how to prepare it, and more. A champion of shrinking this distance and of understanding how all these pieces fit together is an activist, an advocate, and a journalist, a person whose career has been devoted to making it easier for people to eat healthy food and good food, Mark Bittman. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food. I am Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and Professor of Public Policy at Duke. Mark was an opinions columnist for the New York Times, a food columnist for the paper's dining section, and the lead food writer for the New York Times Magazine. His column, known as The Minimalist, ran for more than 13 years. He also hosted a weekly minimalist cooking video on the New York Times website. He is a member of the faculty of the Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. He also appeared as a guest judge on the Food Network Chopped. Mark is the author of 14 books, including the best-selling book, How to Cook Everything, which I happen to love, and Vegan Before Six. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. <laughs> it's great to be here, Kelly. I hope we have time to talk after that lengthy <laughs> and quite flattering introduction. Thank you. Well, it was a fraction of what I could have said, and I very much appreciate our con our connection over the years. So let me let me begin with the following question. So you were a correspondent for the climate change documentary called Years of Living Dangerously. Why would a climate change documentary include a food journalist? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because in a way it was a bone of contention between the producers and me, I thought there should be much, there should have been much more food substance in Years of Living Dangerously. They wanted to do some, and they also liked me. They liked my voice. They liked my TV presence and so on. So um, I wound up reporting on methane production, but not from cows, from, from leaks in methane wells and on Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy and its impact on the New Jersey coastline. So it was, I really didn't get to talk about agriculture, but as, as you know, I'm sure agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gas production and po quite possibly the leading, if not the second leading, it depends how you look at it, contributor to climate change. So I'm still waiting for the show that talks about climate change and agriculture because it is a big deal. So our listeners will have varying levels of uh, knowledge of the impact of food production on environment. If you were to put together a show that you just mentioned, what would you include in it? Well, I think the, the number one problem with, and there are many problems with agriculture in the industrialized West, but I, I think probably the primary one is our, is industrial production of animals, which is the biggest contributor to climate, biggest single contributor to climate change in agriculture. And also has a, a number of other egregious environmental effects. So from the lagoon, the waste lagoons that are that result from hog production to the air pollution that results from chicken houses and so on. I mean, we're talking about anonymous looking barns that um, may have hundreds of thousands of chickens in them and thousands of hogs in them, which are, you know, really, really big numbers of animals kept in crowded, torturous, and pollution-producing situations. Is there an alternative to these kind of things if well, the world <laughs> wants as much meat as it does? Well, the second half of that question sort of <laughs> takes issue <laughs> with the first. The, al the alternative yes. is really going to be to eat less meat. And, and um, you know, what's happening in the world today is that countries like India and China with huge populations and increasing uh, numbers of people with relative wealth, um, and the word relative is important here, but enough money to be able to buy meat. Those people want to eat like Americans have eaten for the last 50 or 70 years. But the real key to environmental sanity and, and a number of other things, but let's just say environmental ecological sanity, is for us to eat the way the Chinese and the Indians have eaten traditionally, which is to say with a more plant-based diet. I wouldn't say meat is forbidden. I wouldn't say that we have to stop eating meat. But from a public health perspective and a personal health perspective and an environmental perspective, and for that matter, from a moral perspective, 
we'd all be better off eating less than half the amount of meat we eat now. Well, Mark, what what you're what I'm hearing from you is a little unusual to be hearing from a cookbook author because there are people who write about food, cookbooks and columns, for example, people who work on environmental issues, people who are advocates, but not many people do all these things. You do. Why do you believe it's important to put all these pieces together? Well, I do think that um I love that question, by the way. I do think that cooking remains an important tool in helping people eat better. When you cook, it's almost impossible to eat as badly as you do when you don't. When you look at what you're putting in your body in a raw, unprocessed state, it's much easier to eat well than it is when you go through a drive through window and just ask for whatever you're craving. And And you and I both know we could spend a lot of time talking about the, the degradation, I guess, is the word of the food environment, the way that food has been increasingly presented to us in the last 50 years, which just makes it easier and easier for people to eat badly. So, you know, cooking is one of the tools that help people eat better. But at the same time, we need we need policy changes. We need to be pressuring food companies to do things differently. We need regulations so that our food system doesn't increasingly produce food that's bad for us while having a negative impact on the environment. And that is not something that is under individuals' control. Those are societal changes. So I, I, while I, you know, I started as a cookbook author, and I, I do strongly believe in cooking, I also think it's important to talk about the kind of changes we need to make as a group, as a society in order to produce food better, eat food better, um, and steward the land and the earth in general better. What's happened with norms around cooking over the years, and how many people are doing it compared to before? Well, it's very hard to gather numbers because if you, if you go to the store and buy a microwave pizza, buy a chocolate cake, and buy a six-pack of Coke, and you bring that home and microwave the pizza and cut up the cake, according to USDA numbers, that's cooking. So it's hard to know it's hard to know who's cooking what and how many people are doing it. Anecdotally it does seem like the numbers plummeted in the 70s, 80s and 90s and have climbed a little bit. Since then that is millennials are cooking more than their, you know, the generations that preceded them. But for for real numbers it's hard to know. And one of the indicators of how many people are cooking versus how many people aren't is chronic disease. And we believe, and there are some studies that would back us up, we, we believe that the more you cook, the less susceptible you are to chronic disease, such as diabetes and coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, and so on, diseases that are caused by the way we live, lifestyle, or, uh, you know, which, which may mean everything from smoking to cooking to eating to uh, exercise and so on. As chronic disease numbers increase, and they have, it's easy to believe that, that the numbers of people who cook are, are going down. Mark, if the numbers are trending up for the millennial generation, why do you think that is? Is it because they're more interested than generations that preceded them in the story of their food, where it came from, how it was produced and things? Well, I think there is that, but I also think in the last 20 years, let's say, it's become increasingly evident that the food system does not deserve the does not serve the people that it should be serving that is the greater the greater population and that's caused many people uh you know starting with Francis Moore Le Pay in nine, in the 70s but um continuing with Eric Schlosser and um with the the film the film Food Inc and and so on people have been exposed to information about how the food system is not serving them, and they're trying to figure out, at least some are trying to figure out, how to make it work better for greater numbers of people. You know, I want to, I want to, if we're talking generalities, and it seems we are big picture stuff, I want to say that if you asked most people what a food system ought to look like, they might give an answer like it should provide the greatest number of people with the best nutrition possible while doing the least damage that it possibly can to animals and the land and workers and so on. And that is not what we have. We have a food system that's designed strictly for the profit of the people who are running it. And, and that is not a public health 
that's a bad public health decision and that's a bad environmental decision. And I think people are starting to see that and trying to turn that around. Um, at least I hope so. Well, I see the same thing in that it represents a big change because at one point, if you'd ask people what a good food system would be, it would be two Whoppers for two dollars. <laughs> well, if you know, if that's your definition of a good food system, then we're practically there. But when you look at chronic disease numbers and when you look at environmental damage and so on, then you're looking at something different than two Whoppers for two dollars. It does. It does depend what you think is the greatest good for the greatest number, I suppose. Well, let's shift gears a bit and talk about your book, Vegan Before Six. And in this book, you discuss a flexitarian way of eating. Could you explain that concept? I mean, really, flexitarianism is not that different from being omnivorous. That is to say, someone who defines themselves as a flexitarian will eat everything or is, can choose to eat everything. But the the trend in the trend in good diets today is to emphasize plant foods, and the trend is to emphasize unadulterated, minimally processed plant foods. So it's fine to say eat more plant foods, but let's remember that both French fries and Coke have their origins in plants. So we have to talk about what kind of plants we want to emphasize, and as most people know, that means unprocessed fruits and vegetables, whole grains olive oils, nuts and seeds, um, olive and other oils, I meant to say, nuts and seeds. So um, it doesn't mean you can't eat meat, you can't eat dairy, you can't eat cheese. It doesn't even mean you can't eat junk food now and then. It means that the emphasis on our diets should be in unprocessed plant foods. And that, in a way, goes back to the one of the earlier questions you asked, which is, how can we continue to eat and produce meat at the rate that we are? And the answer is, we really cannot. So, Mark, it's, it's a diet of kindness, isn't it? It's a diet mm -hmm. that's kind to the environment, kind to animals, and kind to your own health. It's kind of that kind of I thought you were making a pun, but yeah. Um, no. It's a diet that, I mean, I, rather than, I mean, yes, it is a diet of kindness, but it's also a diet of respect and wisdom. I mean, if we want to be here, a hundred years from now, we want to consider ourselves people who do the right thing, and we want to live long enough to do the right thing, then we need to take a, a close look, not only at our diets, but at the way we produce food, because agriculture and diet are uh, closely aligned. They could not be more closely aligned that each affects the other. So how do we grow food and what food do we choose to grow? What food do we choose to eat and how do we produce it? These are all kind of the same question. Um, and if we want those things to be sustainable, which is, a very, you know, people sometimes mock the word sustainable, but it's a very real and useful word. If we want those things to be sustainable, if we want human and other life on earth to be sustainable, then we need sustainable agriculture and sustainable diets. And that's not what we have right now. Well, Mark, you're great, great at seeing the big picture. And as you project out into the future, what are some pieces of the food picture that alarm you most? You know, it's sad but true that you and I had this discussion 10 years ago, um, and I think the answers have not changed much. And um, one of the things that, that I have a pet three things that, that alarm me the most, but, you know, one could go on. But one of them, which is the routine use of antibiotics in the production of animals, is something that could be easily changed and could have been changed 10 years ago. It certainly should have been changed during the Obama administration, and it hasn't been. So if you're, if you're giving animals antibiotics routinely, prophylactively, preventively, then you're enabling the crowding of, anim of animals in um, production facilities, and you're uh, making antibiotics less efficient, less effective when it comes to treating humans. That is really a scary thing. And as a result, we have bacteria that are antibiotic resistant now that we didn't used to have. And humans are dying as a result of this. So that's my number one. My number two, and I know you and I are closely aligned on this, my, my number two is that there's no reg, virtually no regulation on the selling of junk food to children. And that means that we're 
normalizing bad diets for kids who don't know any better, which means every year that that happens means another year of adults who struggle with bad diets. So that would be my second. And the third is a little more technical, but basically it's that we grow so much food um, using the technique that's generally called monoculture, which means we grow one crop at a, t at a time on very large swaths of land, which encourage mechanization, which in turn encourages the use of pesticides and other chemicals and encourages the growth of, encourages our growing crops like corn and soybeans, which mostly are used to come full circle to feed those industrially produced animals and to produce the junk food that's making us sick. So those three things are my top, my top scary things. And if you ask me if I think they're going to change, it sort of depends which side of the bed I wake up on. I certainly hope they're going to change. Well, when I, I ask you what alarms you most, what are some of the things you see as positive signs? They're smaller, um, but they're not insignificant. And they're, they're more um, individual. I think one of the things that I, that I see are farmers who are choosing to grow um, a variety of crops and a variety of crops that go to feed real people and steward the land. We see that all over the country and all over the world. Um, we see farmers who are choosing to grow crops in a sustainable manner. I wouldn't say organic, although that's part of it, but the word that we choose to use more these days is agroecologically, that is ag agriculture with an eye towards ecology. We see things like Good Food Purchasing Program, which helps cities determine who's growing and producing and selling things um, in a sustainable manner and focus their purchasing on those, on those production, on those producers. Um, so it's, it's, it's not global the way you can say monoculture, industrial agriculture is global, but it is, these are things that are, we're seeing more and more of, and they are encouraging. Well, Mark, it's nice to end on some positive notes like that, but I'd like to ask you one more thing. <laughs> uh, you're publishing a newsletter that people can receive via email. Now I receive it and I like it a lot. Can people get it? Yeah, the newsletter is new. It's uh, just about two months old, and anyone can can receive it by just going to markbitman dot com. And um, I welcome you to do that. It's act it's actually a good week to do that because we have some interesting stuff coming up. But yes, thank you for that, Kelly. So, Mark, thanks so much for being a, a guest today. I, I've always appreciated your expertise, and it's really nice of you to share it with our listeners. So, thank you again. Thanks for having me, Kelly. It was very flattering and enjoyable. So. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Our guest today is food journalist Mark Bittman, author of Vegan Before Six and many other books, and um, well-known expert on the food system overall. And thank you to our listeners. Please subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcasts, or by visiting our website at the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.